So my name is uh, Lisa Macy. I'm from Marquette University Law School, and I am doing the uh, working with the AALS section in Women in Legal Education on the Oral History Project. And mm -hmm. today we're talking with Margaret Jane Radin, and going to take down her oral history. So, um, Peggy, let's start with the beginning. Where and when were you born? I was born six days before Old Pearl Harbor in the Bronx of New York. Um, my mother was a Hungarian immigrant, Austro-Hungarian Empire at the time. She was one year old when she was brought here. Um, my father was the, the son of a doctor in New York, and, and that doctor had two brothers, one of whom was Max Raid that I didn't learn about until much later. They were all liberals. My father was rebellious, was the black sheep of the family. So we lived in New Jersey for a while, but by the time I was five, we arrived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and that's where I grew up. Okay. And graduated Did high school there in 1959. Okay. Did you have brothers and sisters? I had one brother, John. He was and was he younger? Or is he two young? years younger? Okay. Yes. Okay. So you don't. Do you remember much of your time at all in the in the East Coast before getting to Albuquerque? No, very little. I remember that I thought we had a giant cat, but I now realize I was very small. <laughs> and I remember the the place of my uncle and my three cousins who were all they were they were younger than we were, so they were very young and and uh, my uncle was also Hungarian, obviously on the, and he was on my mother's side, so so that's all I remember. I don't I remember actually I have to tell you I remember that New Jersey coming into New York smelled really bad. I remember that from being four years old. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very powerful memory. Yes, yeah, you can remember that from being little, right. So your family moved out to Albuquerque for, it was for your father's job then? Yeah, he got a job at, in, in Sandia Bays. He was a mechanical engineer and, and we moved there, but they kind of traveled around a little bit thinking about places in the West. They really wanted, I think, no one knows, it's not written down, but I think they wanted to get away from my father's family who, who uh, they, were secular, they were secular Jews, but they didn't pretend not to be Jewish, and my father did. He pretended not to be Jewish. He joined the John Birch Society. He kept a gun and all that stuff. So, so he wanted to get away from them, and um, we don't know the answers to any of these. This is just conjectural. but. But we drove around, the family drove around. Um, we were in El Paso, Texas. My, my brother got measles and mumps at the same time and almost died. So we oh were my. there for a while. We were in Denver and we ended up in Albuquerque where he did get a job at, the, at Sandia. Um, and uh, when I was 16 years old, I worked there typing too. Um, and we typed things in 13 copies with carbon paper. It was before Xerox. Wow. Yeah. So, in growing up in Albuquerque, um, what did you enjoy when, when you were a young oh, girl? Oh, I very much enjoy the scenery. It's a beautiful place. It still is. It's mountain. It's high desert country. It's got really interesting plants and trees, and and it's just lovely weather. The sky is so blue; it hurts your eyes. I didn't enjoy being allergic to tumbleweeds and other things. I was allergic to. And I really didn't enjoy school there. Um, I think I was kind of a misfit. You know, How there come? were there were a group of intellectuals in my high school, and we went to coffee shops and discussed great things, like many teenagers do. But uh, but it was clear I was going away to college, and I did. And I left when I was 17 for college, and I never went back, really, except to a reunion one. But then an ironic thing happened to me, if I can skip forward. The mm -hmm. ironic thing happened. Um, <laughs> you'll have to learn more about the past to know how ironic it was. But, but um, in about the year 04, my second and youngest child, yeah, she graduated from high school and went to college. So I decided to visit some other place. And I visited University of Michigan. Um, and there, in the music department, they invited me to come over and talk about copyright, and I did. But I said, in order to do this, I'm very busy, you'll have to find a music teacher for me, because I'm a flutist. So I said, okay, you have to find a flute teacher for me. The flute professor, who's a very famous person, 
um, in the flute world was happening by and she liked how I was talking back to her male colleagues. So she said she would teach me herself. So, so I learned how to play again after raising these kids as a single parent and not playing for a while. And I went to a music camp in Pennsylvania, a, a small music camp at a, a, a music camp at a small college called Chambers, in a place called Chambersburg. And, 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 I'm, and I met this guy there who played the violin. And, and uh, he was a teacher there. And I was a student. Um, and, um, and so when we sat down to talk, it was a friendly music camp, and, and he said, where are you from? And I said, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he was too. He was from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Wow. So in the end, we were married in Albuquerque, New Mexico some years ago, maybe seven and a half now. Yeah. And lived happily ever after, pretty much. But there is a long story in between, as you can see. Right, right. right. So, and, so and it was, Albuquerque was under 100,000 when I was there, so it was a striking coincidence, <laughs> really. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So you didn't particularly like school. I did not. I was, af I was afraid that I would be a misfit for the rest of my life. And I thought, if this doesn't get better when I go to college, I might have to kill myself. Oh, no. I, I never did try or anything. And I did get better when I went to college, although the first year was sort of rocky. But the, you know, the, the other students, if they think you're a brain or, or something different, they are just they just taunt a lot, and right. I was sensitive to it, and it didn't, I didn't know where I was coming from, I didn't know about my history, so I didn't, I didn't know how to take care of that, so I just felt, oh, something's wrong with me. And, so and you felt like a misfit because you were more intellectual and more curious about intellectual things than your fellow students at the... I was, and there's a certain thing about being Jewish, even if you don't know it, um, I found that out when I, I did my graduate work in music history at Brandeis, where and they knew before I did. Right? I found out when I was at Brandeis, but they knew already because there's a certain way that the mind works at, with some of us, and and so I felt like an outcast, and I didn't know the reason. And, and some of it was being intellectual. I I was. I was co-valedictorian in a class of 600 or so, and the other guy, Murray Katz, was Jewish too, although openly, and that, that's all the Jews there were in Albuquerque. I'm exaggerating. There were, you know, right. a half dozen or a dozen in my class. But. Right. So that was how my parents got away with it. Right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Right. So from, um, from reading um, about you, it sounds like you had no intention of doing law. And as a young girl, and when you went to college, you went for something. That is true. I went to Stanford University on a merit scholarship. I had heard that it was a good school. I knew nothing about it, not a thing. And I get, I got the merit scholarship, and and I went to Stanford. Of, of course, everyone who's listening to this knows that I could not apply to the Ivies in 1959 because they weren't taking girls. And maybe not everybody knows that Stanford was only taking one in, you know, Stanford had a quota, but we called it the ratio. They had three boys to one girl. And, and um, so I went there, and, and during that time, you probably know it was the Sputnik era, so mm -hmm. all of us who were, who were doing well in high school were supposed to major in the sciences, and so I took all the physics courses, 15 units of engineering physics, liked that a lot, took 24 units of college math, thought I might like to major in political science that I didn't like after one semester, and then I had two years left, and I thought, I'm gonna finish in two years because I have a scholarship for two more years, so, right. I, so I majored in music. I, I realized that I was going to, I was in the chorus, and I was in the choir, and I was in the orchestra, and I was in chamber music, and I ought to be a music major. My, my parents were not happy. I recall, I hope I don't recall incorrectly, because may her memory be a blessing. She was born in 1912, so she's been gone for a long time. But I recall my mother saying, oh, well, she was unhappy with being a music major, but I recall her saying, oh, well, you're only a girl. And I but I, I took piano and flute when I was young. I played in the New Mexico All-State Orchestra. I did everything musical, and music caught me when I was 11. I heard a piece of music, and I thought, this is the history of mankind learning how to do this. And so, so clearly, I was supposed to be a musician, but, but there weren't, it wasn't possible to um, 
go to a conservatory and, and try and come out and get a job. And nobody hired women in those days. And I sort of knew that. Right. So I was going to be a scientist, and it didn't work. So I majored in music anyway. And right, and you, were, you played the flute. I still play, play the flute. Play yeah. the flute, I should say. Yeah, I still play the flute every day. So, and I would, I do want to get to that on a yeah. on a separate theme. But um, so, you when you went to you got the scholarship to Stanford. Um, were your parents supportive of you going to college? Were they? Did you always assume you would go to college? Yes. Because as you said, it was an era where girls weren't really yeah. expected to do yes, too much. Yes, but, but but people from people from professional Jewish families did expect their daughters to go to college, and I didn't have a problem with that. And they were snobby about it. They probably would have wanted me to go to the University of New Mexico, which is a really good university, but they thought that's not good enough, so they let me go to Stanford. But, and um, yeah, my father was a very confused person, but it did make me realize that you can have really awful political beliefs and be a very bright person, because he was, and he read chemistry books for pleasure. And I think he was depressed, we think, you know because he sat around in a chair and let my mother do all the work. And, but he listened to classical music, and I, I heard Beethoven quartets before I could talk. You know, so I've been raised with music in, in, spite, of, in spite of all this. So that, that's, that was something. But, but yeah, they, didn't, they were supportive of my going to college, and, and, uh, and I, it was paid for. And, so, mm -hmm. and I took the bus there after I, I mean, I flew on a plane the first time, and I was really scared to go there on my own. I had never seen the Pacific Ocean or any such thing. And I, when I got there, I saw all these people of higher social classes, New York debutantes and stuff. And I had one skirt and two pairs of shoes. And it was, it was it, first year was enlightening. But um, and we had, we had um, house mothers and, you know, late leads and stuff like that. And my, some, of my, some of my housemates got pregnant anyway. <laughs> mm. right. So you were you were saying uh, earlier that yeah. if you thought if things didn't get better when you went to college, that that you would would think about ending your life. And you said that first year was bumpy. It was a bit bumpy, but the, you know I got I got, I went four zero fall quarter, and I didn't think it was that hard, even though I was taking these hard classes. And I thought this is doable, and 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 these kids, some of them are interesting. So I never thought about it again after I went to college. Luckily. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah yes. Yeah, very much yeah, so. Yeah. So um, uh, then you did you, so you decided to major in music, and did you have any thought of what you might do thereafter? For for work. Yeah, PhD. I I moved to Berkeley, um, they, which was a very good very good school for history of music, and they had better stipends than the schools on the east by a factor of two and a half, basically. So, so then that was really good time. And I thought, OK, I'll, I'll be a professor of history of music. And um, they weren't very good at sending out their women for the interviews in those days, but they did some. And, and a very good friend of mine, Sarah Fuller, who was a year ahead of me, um, got a job at, at Stony Brook and, and teaching history of music and, and being a scholar in history of music. And, and she spent her whole career there. She just retired recently. She still lives around here. And I see her when I get to come to this mm -hmm. here. But, but you know, when she got that and she was a year ahead of me, I thought, I don't really want this. I want to be a musician, but I don't want to teach other musicians about music bibliography. I, I probably should have majored in history of ideas or something like that. And so I didn't. So I quit after being advanced to candidacy and having my dissertation approved and everything. They were very mad at me. Mm, were your parents um, glad you were back on the West Coast at a? Yeah, they had moved to, from Albuquerque to to Santa Monica in the meantime, and I think they were. But but I haven't actually conveyed to you how estranged from them I was. And of course, by that time. I had spent this time in Berkeley, and I had made my own decisions about what was reported in the mainstream media versus what I saw on the street when I was in peace marches. And so I was totally on the left, and they were totally on the right. And so, and since they had cut me off when I went to Brandeis, and, and my mother being old school European, I don't think she was much ready to let me back. Um, mm -hmm. 
it, it, yeah, but eventually I married someone I knew from Berkeley, that, and it didn't work out. We were divorced after a couple of years, but and I invited my parents to the wedding, and I didn't think they would come. The wedding was on San Gregorio Beach, but they did come, not dressed for beach, but they did, they they, came. They did come. So it wasn't it wasn't yeah. totally like you never spoke to me again. Yeah. So I yeah. So given the time, so you are in Berkeley now in the the mid to later 60s? I am. What? I was in, I was, my, I think I dropped out in 68. So what the, a the refusal, fantastically interesting time to be there. The refusal of induction at the Oakland Induction Center was, oh, I believe, if I don't recall wrongly, over 80 percent. And, and the, I taught music appreciation as a TA and some of my students were under the influence of various drugs, but some of them were really scared they were going to be sent away. And I, I talked to them, and 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 I learned what people were doing. They were, they were trying to starve themselves. They were trying to, do. You remember this, do you? Yeah, that's what it was like. And so, so in those days, people like me thought we should do something relevant. And and I thought history of music, while well, it was interesting, was not relevant, and I should do something relevant, and I didn't know what that was going to be. And so, so I had married this guy, and I got work as a secretary, because they do ask girls in those days, do you know how to type? And I did know how to type. My, mm -hmm. my mother was a very good typist, and I, was learning, I learned how to type. So, so I did that, and I was supporting him, because he was a pretty good pianist and wanted to be a musician. So then, I started to work as a typist type for, for uh, Melvin Ian Myers in downtown Los Angeles, and four of them decided to quit working for this big firm and, and start a public interest firm called the Southern California Center for Law and the Public Interest. So, so I went with them, and um, now I'm not naming their names, but they were more sexist about, mo three out of the four were more sexist about secretaries than the big guys in the fancy firm were. But eventually the same thing happened. They would let me write things as long as I didn't tell the others. And they promoted me to fundraising, which I was bad at. And they, they had hired one woman attorney who later had a great career, but she said, you should go to law school. And I thought, you know what, maybe so. Nobody will ever ask me if I can type. If I go to law school. So I thought I would go to law school and get a job where I wouldn't ask me how to type. And so she tried to persuade me to go to Yale, which was her alma mater. And so I applied and they admitted me. I, I had a high score on the LSAT because in those days you still did math and I'm not scared of math. Mm -hmm. So probably, I may have been the highest woman they saw that year, although who knows. But they admitted me. But then they, and so I asked about financial aid because I didn't have anything. I was working as a secretary, and I got back a letter that said, your husband will support you. And of course, this guy had, I was, A, I was supporting him, and B, he didn't think I should go to law school because he didn't really like women who did things that men did. So we ended up getting a divorce. So I was mad at Yale, so I said, screw this. I wrote them an angry letter and, and applied to University of Southern California. So that's where I went. And. Um, you probably know that the number of people, not just females, but the number of people with degrees from the University of Southern California are not very heavily represented in legal academia. Right. But I didn't know that at right. the time. Right, right. And, and I got a full scholarship, so I graduated without student loans one more time, and that was excellent. Right. So you were going now to law school in the, in the mid-70s. Yes, I, I entered in 73 and graduated in 76. Okay, yeah. and you were by then a little older than the I was average. 10 years older than the rest of them because I had spent this time with, with music and, and stuff by working a little bit in, right. at, at, at making legal documents for people. Right. And, um, and I made a couple of good friends there, really, one of them I still see. Um, the class was 25% women, which was the first class that had that many. We were 50% order of the coit when we graduated, which made me realize they didn't admit nearly enough. And I found out why when I, I later went back to teach there, which was an unusual thing to do, but that's the way it happened. And then I was on the admissions committee, and then I saw why, because 
a guy with an economics degree from Princeton who was okay was favored over a woman who was at the top of the class from Fresno State and nobody asked whether she had a husband and kids and had to go to Fresno State. That just wasn't on the agenda. So they weren't admitting enough qualified women in those days. I think they are now. So yeah. That was a long time ago. So I graduated in 76. Um, I should tell you, I don't know, this could, this narrative could go on forever. So there's a required first year course called Law, Language, and Ethics at USC, which I admire very much. And I later taught it for a number of years, quite a few. But the guy who was teaching that course ended his ended the class with a rape joke. And because we were 25% women for the first time, we hissed. And he was in shock. He just had no idea this wasn't fun. Right. <laughs> in 1973, yeah. Yeah, wow. so that's how it was then. Wow. Um, all right, so I graduated in 76. Yeah, but let's let's talk a little bit about your law school, law oh, school okay, experience. So, yeah. um, so now you've made the decision to go to law school. You go to, to University of Southern California. Uh, how was that first year? So at least you have a, 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 a larger cohort of women than yeah. previous yeah. women. And might one of have. them is a lifelong friend. And right. Another friend, though, dropped out and moved to New York to live with somebody who left her for somebody else. Things like that happened, too. Right, right. Yeah. Did, um, did, did you feel, OK, so you had the one professor who ended class with the yeah. The rape joke, but how did you feel? Um, did you feel welcomed by the other, with, by your male classmates? Do they? Do you think that they resented your being there? Oh, all different. You know, some of them were welcoming. Some of them wondered if I wanted to date them, and some of them were not welcoming. <laughs> <laughs> no. right. right, right. Even and and you were older. And you I was older, older, but nobody knew it. And of course, I wore hippie type clothes. You know, I'd show up in a long skirt and a midriff thing, and th nobody, people didn't know. Okay. Right. right. Okay. Um, yeah. And did you like any, given what you ended up doing, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> did you like any of your, your first year classes more than others? Or did you, when you got there, did yeah. you feel like, I found my place? Yeah, to some extent. I, actually, this is going to be interesting, too. I really liked Michael E. Levine. Of course, all my teachers were white guys, but I liked Michael Levine, who who never wrote much, but he was a pan-intellectual. He, he, he was, it was the beginning of the era of law and economics, and, and so most of these people were on the, on the cutting edge of law and economics. Some of them had actually come from Chicago and gone to USC, but, but, but this guy, he did that, but, but he did it with an interest in all all kinds of ways people had looked at it and how the history of it was looking at it and and um, and I, I liked him very much he was my favorite teacher and I took his classes whatever he offered but I had him for torts and and he was teaching from Calabrese's um, cost of accidents which had just mm -hmm. come out and I had never heard the term resource allocation mm -hmm. so I had to learn about law and economics quickly which I did it's not that hard once you buy all the premises you just make yeah. And so, so later they're still teaching like that. Many people are, but but now I know I know that I I I I made a what is called Raiden's cheat sheet by others, not by me, which mm -hmm. lists all the premises, and I hand it out to students, and and um, and I put it in the middle of my most recent book too, so students can see because I think teachers teach from that with all these mysterious words like Pareto optimality without telling people that it all depends on a certain idea of human beings being rational in the sense that economists believe and a certain idea that we can sum up all values which we don't believe and all that stuff. So I, right. so I got into it and I liked that guy because yeah. he was a good intellectual and really liked music. <laughs> Yeah. You know? oh, well, there yeah. you go. There you yeah. go. And yeah. so you felt you felt like you found you you found your people in a sense. You know, yeah. people, smart people talking about interesting, smart. Yeah, I, things. I did feel like that. Um, not. I mean, I missed being at the top of the class by a tenth of a grade point, and so and and in lots of classes I was the top student. So that was um, another person who went on full scholarship because his wife wanted to go to the school of dentistry was Matt Spitzer who also became a, a teacher and he was a good friend of mine he's he's still an economist has a PhD from Caltech but 
but he found me to be a lefty that he could talk to because mm -hmm. we all were interested in how to be rational about this. And he's still a good friend, too. And he's ended up at Northwestern, I think, in charge of a, um, an economic think tank sort of thing, where I'm now a senior something or other, because <laughs> he, he named me to it. But, but um, what was I talking about? So, um, so how I felt about it was this was exciting. It was way more exciting than I thought. It was like I was up in the middle of the night reading something about criminal law, and I thought, this is about philosophy. This is really exciting. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So it was law school was really interesting. So then I thought, well, I might like to be a professor. Academics is coming back to get me. But then I thought, I can't ever do that because I didn't go to Yale, and so, uh-oh. So, so I decided I would get, and I didn't want to. Oh, do I have time to tell you about my interviewing with the firms? <laughs> oh yes, please, yes. But wait, so but you did so you said you missed being at the top of the class by just a bit, but you did graduate order of the Koi. Oh sure, yeah, and I missed by a tenth of a grade point because I took a class from a guy who was teaching from the Gilberts that that had already been superseded and and I couldn't understand what he wanted on his exam. Right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was my fault. If you ever, and I always tell people, if you ever meet a teacher like that, don't take the class. Yeah. You, know, you can learn it from the new Gilberts, for gosh sakes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Did you do any? Um, uh, did you do law review or any kind of activities in law school? Activities. Well, um, I was a member of various civic groups, I think. I, I, I did get onto Law Review. It was on grades in those days. And, and I was going to write a student note on how the Supreme Court was treating the death penalty. And of course, at the time, there was a chance that they were overturning it. And, and I was quite interested in that. It was philosophically interesting. And I was interested in the philosophy part and also the, the legal part. So that, as a Law Review note, was going to take a long time. So. So the, the guys that ran the law review, and I think it was all men, many of them ha were veterans, so they were a little bit um, rule bound. And so I asked for an extension on, the, on my note, and they said, no, we can't do that for you. And so, so I knew that other people were just being late and hadn't asked for the extension, so I got mad. I need to watch my temper. I don't do this anymore now that I'm old, but anyway. I got mad and I resigned from the Law Review. And then people told me, don't resign from the Law Review. It's a bad idea because you'll want it to get a job. So, so I called them back and said, no, I rescind my resignation. So, so they had a big meeting and they decided that resignations were non-rescindable. Hmm. And, they, and they actually kept a dossier on this whole episode, which I found out about when I went back to teach at USC and was made to be advisor of the Law Review. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, they still had the dossier on me. So, um, so let's see. So what happened after that? So then I didn't finish that note. It became my first article. It was 100 pages long, and it was published in the Pennsylvania Law Review. <laughs> so that was OK. Yeah, there you and go. It was called The Jurisprudence of Death. <laughs> it is a catchy title. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but, but yeah, so then this Law Review fiasco and, and some leftover sexism prevented me from getting a clerkship, which would have helped me be able to become a teacher. So, right. so one thing was there was this judge who has now gone to his reward, who always hired one of the first two or three people at USC that the dean recommended. So the dean recommended me, and he refused to interview me and, and chose a man who was about, I don't know, you know, capable, but much lower ranked than I was. Mm. And I wrote him a letter. I have it still. I found it while I was looking through all my stuff. I didn't remember I did that. So I wrote him a letter, and he answered that this, that this young man had the same surname as his wife's uncle or something, and he liked the guy. Anyway, that's what happened. So, so then I went around to see other judges, and I got answers. Like, this was 76 now. So one of them, the secretary or the receptionist, said, well, um, he hired a woman once, and he's not going to do it again, so you might as well go away. And, and one of them, um, uh, who I thought was a good judge and, and quite liberal, um, 
prosecuted me on my resume. In other words, said, well, what did you do between here and here? <laughs> what did you do with this? Right? So that didn't work out. So eventually, somebody found a clerkship for me. But by that time, two other things had happened. One was I decided, well, I'll go work in DC. The government will hire me. And they did. And I was hired to the, um, the Consumer Bureau of the Federal Trade Commission, which was a good job. But also, out of the blue, the dean of the Oregon Law School called me and asked me if I would come and teach there for a year as a visitor. I was a third year law student, and they called me to teach at their school. And it was. How did they get, <laughs> how did they make that connection? Both those guys that hired me as a typist in San Francisco were graduates of the University of Oregon oh, Law School. Oh, yeah. well, there you go. Yeah, and one of them, who's a very good guy, I saw him again recently because I gave a talk about my book there. And, and I found out, not that he told me he wasn't going to reveal, but I found out from his expression that he had really pushed it, and that's how. So I got the call, and I said, OK, I have to come up and see you. I've never been to Oregon. So I did the inverse interview. and. And I thought, this will be good. And so then I asked them if uh, they would make it a two-year visiting offer. They, you know, they said, we need a woman now. And this a woman had dropped out, so that's why they're calling me in March. So that's OK. I said, all right. So, so um, and this was 76. So I said, OK, well, um, I would like you to make it a two-year visit so I won't have to look for another job the minute I get there. And I would like you to put me on the tenure track if you'd like me after a year. And, the, and I had them put it in writing. How I managed that, I don't know, because I was a shy person. And I, I still am, actually. But anyway, they did that. And by that time, I had my first article in the Penn Law Review, and so they thought I was OK. So, so they were willing to hire me, and, um, and I met a lifelong friend there, too. Unfortunately, he's passed away, but Ed, Ed Baker was my friend and, and really colleague there. So I was lucky to be there, and it was a lovely place. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't such a great place for a single professional woman, though. So, so I moved back to Los Angeles after a couple of years. But um, that's how I got a teaching job when I was a third year law student. Wow. And <laughs> so, what did you teach when you went up to Oregon? A good question. So I. They, um, the dean called me, you know, before I graduated and said, well, we've got you set for, um, for family law and the corrections clinic, the prisoner thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, I'm not too interested in family law and I can't do the corrections clinic because I'm not licensed in any bar, so I can't help your prisoners. <laughs> but that's what they thought a woman like, I suppose. So I said, I'd like to have, teach a first year class. And so, so the dean said, and he was a very sweet guy, but you know he hadn't yet adjusted to the new. You know, the dean said, "Well, we have one, we have property available," so I said, "I'll take it." So that's how I became a property teacher, yeah, and a property theorist most of my life, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And he would introduce me to alumni by saying, "This is Professor So and So and Professor So and So and Peggy." I mean, he never got used to my being a professor, but he was a sweet man. I wouldn't. I wasn't really mad at him for that. I had some trouble with the male students. Yeah, tell me about that. So you, you know, are now a um, maybe well, now, in your I'm a third? tenure track professor, and in, I have just got out of law school. Right. And, and I took the bar exam in the summer, and then I got there in the <laughs> fall and started teaching. And I don't blame right. them. Also, and you're, not, they, you're you're older than them, but not like exceeding. Not much. No, they yeah. took me for a student all the time, right. as they do younger women still. And and not only that, I was assigned to seven different courses in my first two years. Because um, they, first of all, Oregon being a progressive school, I, you know, I have a good memory of it. But they had decided that the regular faculty should teach legal writing, and it wasn't going to be a ghetto. But they didn't want to do it, so they got the new people to do it. So I got to teach legal writing. So, so and I actually really liked trying to do it. It was not easy, but my students and I, sat in the library and I told them to do a brief for a pending case in the Oregon Supreme Court and then go see how it was argued. And it was all well and good, but it was time consuming. They also had me teach international business transactions, which I didn't know a thing about, but I had taken one class in it. And criminal law, which I had sort of thought about because I wrote this article, and property. and. 
and a seminar in criminal something, I think. Have I got up to seven yet? I don't mm, think so. But anyways, right. there were seven different courses in the first wow. few years. So, so the, anyway, so the, the students were a, a little unhappy, you know, this, this guy said, well, you just got out of law school, what can you teach me? And I thought, you know what, he's right. I'm, and so I said, well, they pay me to think about teaching this to you, whereas you have to take lots of different classes. And, and that sort of satisfied him. He, he came around. Mm -hmm. But I also taught antitrust. Yeah, I think I'm now up to six. I forget what's yeah, but I taught antitrust. Um, they said I could teach antitrust. I, I had taken antitrust um, from the teacher that I liked in law school, and I was interested in it. And they said, well, you can teach that. We'll send you to Henry Manny's um, Law and Economics seminar in, in Key Biscayne during the summer. So, so I went there, and I got indoctrinated. But I had already been pre-indoctrinated, so it didn't, it didn't work. So then, so then I taught that. And there were only three women in that class. They were very brave, and the boys were like. You know, mm -hmm. so I had to show up a few of them, and then it was okay. It was all right. They were, they were nice enough. I got worse evaluations from guys the year that I taught as a visitor at UCLA, which was after I left Oregon. So I was visiting at UCLA 78, 79, and that was a strange time, too. They were interested in affirmative action. And they had had a lot of difficulty with their Chicano students, well deserved probably. And so, the two Chicano, the two you know, uh, Hispanic people, men that they were looking at, and me were all on one corridor by ourselves. And so, so we knew each other. But um, then the two Hispanic men got offers, and then the appointments chair came to my office and said, well. We're making offers to them, and that's affirmative action enough, so you can go back to Oregon. He actually said that's affirmative action enough. I now think in my later years that he may have believed in affirmative action and was being ironic. But um, it hurts us to be called affirmative action when affirmative action is is openly stated to be a thumb on the scale. So I ended up read, writing an article about that, which got published in an obscure venue called Social Theory or something. But I should put that on SSRN. Because at the time, um, it was it had a backlash and for mm -hmm. us that we were called affirmative action people, so we weren't as good, but they were going to let us in. That was not good. And, mm -hmm. and these UCLA people were just as sexist as I could have imagined. The, the, the boys I taught, I guess they were the boys that couldn't get into Harvard, and so they, were, they, were, they wrote things like, about my clothes, of course, which happens to all kinds of, but, but also, I haven't had any women teachers before, and I don't want to have any anymore, and that, that sort of stuff. And I went over to interview at USC, and I was their alum, and so some of them were a little dubious. But because I was their alum and had done well with them, they were OK to listen. And they were, they were, many of them were too conservative for affirmative action, which, ironically enough, was much better for me, mm -hmm. right? Now, Dorothy Nelson was the dean. and. And um, they asked me some, when at the, at the talk, I was talking, as I recall now, I was talking about Ronald Dworkin and the, the philosophy types liked it and the economics types, I was able to talk there, speak. So I was doing okay, but then someone asked me a question and she thought it was too hard. So she said, you don't have to answer that. And I said, I will <laughs> answer that. So there was, there was still this, this kind of tension, but they hired me. and. And I was the first woman hired on the tenure track at, at USC okay. Center, okay. Law Center. And because uh, um, Dorothy had, I mean, she later became a judge, as you know, and she, she was a smart person, but she had not been on the tenure track. She had been doing some other administrative thing. And, and when the previous dean died, she took over in the interim. And they liked her a whole lot as, as, as an external dean. And they arranged the internal stuff to be done by a committee they called the administrative committee or something. And, and uh, so we hired another female in a couple of years, Judith Resnick. And she was the second woman hired on the tenure track. 
And um, this is the early 80s now, so it's about the time that Carol Gilligan is writing in a different voice. Right, so, right. So Judith and I decided to give a, a workshop, a paper, a talk on, on feminist legal theory. <laughs> and and so, so then a male colleague came up to us afterwards and said, you shouldn't do this. You weren't hired to do this. <laughs> Right, but I guess we did it anyway, pretty much. Right. It was okay. <laughs> so was when okay. you when you were at USC, then to you what did you start to narrow down what you want, were teaching? In, yeah, in, I in did. I in? taught property repetitively, and I taught criminal law and criminal procedure for a while, and, and then just criminal procedure, and and then after that, I I let that go to do property and. And I think I probably, did. I also taught that required course in law, language, and ethics over and over again. I thought it was very, very valuable. The students who need it the most really don't like it. Mm -hmm. They don't want to find out how much we reinterpret and how much our client depends on it. Right? They might have to overturn some holding you've carefully written out, you know. Mm -hmm. you, have to, you have to teach them how to do that if they want to get one of these jobs that they think they're going to get. So, so they would be mean until they'd come back for the fifth year reunion and then they'd say this was the best course I ever took. So I knew that so I was able to just cool it with them. And most of us who taught that class eventually ended up with our own materials. So I have thick books of materials which which have poems and other things in them too. And that's that's what's required. So I was very happy with that. And I was happy with property. Um, I did a second article on on uh, death penalty. And after that, I switched over to writing about property for quite a while. And so the, f the first article was Property and Personhood. And, and that, I got the idea for that when I was in my third year of teaching it when I was at UCLA. And, um, and it was because the students and I all had these intuitions that, that some property is just for, for trading and other property is different and closer to the self. So, mm -hmm. so I decided to write about that. and. Um, and that was the third article, and um, right, be and that was, that was right before tenure. And um, as I recall, it got published in the Stanford Law Review because one student liked it, and he and he had he had a way. In those days, you didn't have to have a committee. I think all law reviews now have a committee. But, so he he decided he took it, and and uh, it got published, and then everybody liked it. Much to my amazement, because the people at USC, we were we had a workshop every week. It was a wonderful culture, which was probably never going to come back. Everybody read the paper on Friday morning and spent Friday afternoon talking about it. And and the rule was, you were not only were you supposed to read the paper, but you were supposed to be constructive. And 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 we followed that rule, and we all showed up. But their constructive advice about that piece was, well, it's all over the map, so maybe you shouldn't publish it. And thing is, it was all over the map. It was like property and personhood this, and property and personhood that, and property and personhood the other. But it did have a, it did have a continuing theme, and so I did publish it anyway against their advice. And right, and of course, yeah. it's very well. Now very it's well in all. Now it's in all. Now two paragraphs are in all first year case books. <laughs> right, right, right. Because I'm saying I'm almost sure I read. I've I read. Part you of have it. read two paragraphs. Everyone has read two paragraphs. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, from and wh how long were you at uh, at USC then? I was there until '89. I moved to Stanford in for '89 90. I think I visited, but I I took the job at Stanford, but I visited USC back '89 90. So that was my last year, and I really liked the faculty at USC. That was all fine. Um, I had two kids by then. I was with someone that was not going to work out, too. Uh, they're dead, and so, and I was driving all over the place trying to find a, a daycare and a, and a school for the older one, and they were asking, this was Los Angeles, they were, there was a drive-by shooting at the local public school, and so, and, and it was so overcrowded that most, half the kids had to go outside for half the day with the teacher so that they could use the facilities for the other kids. So, so Los Angeles was the, was the start of the downfall of public education that, that then happened in other places too. And, and I just couldn't do it anymore. I had to say, okay, I really have to move on, even though 
even though I thought USC was fine. I liked their intellectual culture. And so I moved to Stanford where they had a lovely public school with great lawns and fields and teachers who were dedicated and that was, that was all fine. But uh, then, you know, USC had the fortune of, USC Law Center in those days had the fortune of hiring really smart people that were not Supreme Court clerks or were not having the fancy resumes and, and we went to the hiring convention and talked to people and, and found out if they had a kind of mind that would play the, this and, and then we hired them and they all turned out really well partly because of this workshop culture that we had where at USC where people read each other's papers and really tried to think about what everybody else was doing. So, so that was fortunate, but unfortunate was five of them ended up at Yale and five or six of them ended up at Stanford. So, mm. so they kind of lost a lot of people to other places. And so after five or six of us ended up at Stanford, we tried to get Stanford Law School to reinstitute this really great intellectual culture we had and it was impossible mm. because people had much more stuff of their own to do by themselves or with other groups other small groups and we couldn't get a, there was no way to have this group of the whole that, that, that and now people think USC in the 80s was just a, a different sort of thing and it's probably not happening again. I don't, I don't know, I've heard that. I, don't, I hope hmm. it's not true though, it was a good thing. Hmm. So over the course of time as you've, you've um, developed right. now as a, as a scholar and, and hmm. some yeah. acclaim and um, moved to different schools um, what did you notice in terms of the, the students, particularly now, women are starting to get into law school yeah. more and more, more often, yeah. um, and, the, and your interaction with, with and the students' inter, uh, interactions with you and then right. with your colleagues, because now, now at some point it sounds like you're, you're a single mom in a, I was a, single mom in a field that isn't necessarily very hospitable, especially at that time. Yeah. I was a single, single mom from when they were seven and four until they went to college and and my son had some issues with the big urban high school and I had to get his father's permission to send him to a therapy type school in Vermont and so there were lots of other things going on in my life and that's what made me quit playing the flute much for a while. That's why I had to start over when I they both went to college which is now a long time ago. They're 32 and 29 and wait till I tell you what they did but anyway, <laughs> they're all they all turned out, they turned out, both of them turned out well. But yeah, I was a single mom. This was not so easy. And the situation for women was um, very smart women were being admitted. A lot of them didn't say anything in class. The boys were the gunners. The, the men were the speakers. And the number of times a woman, a woman who didn't say anything got the highest grade in the class, I just can't tell you, but it happened all the time. And so then I would talk to her and say, well, you know, you probably thought all this was obvious and it was obvious to you, the things that the men said, but you can now say this in class. <laughs> so I mentored them a bit and eventually I invented this class, which I think, it may have been simultaneously invented by others at other schools or it may have been copied from Stanford, I don't know, but I invented a class called Student Scholarship Workshop. And and I tried to get women and students of color. I, of course, admitted white men, too. They were less interested in taking it, though. And I, and I taught them how to write scholarship and defend it. And I did well at it. I'm very proud of that class. Mm -hmm. And now other schools have it, too. I taught them how to defend it. I taught them how to do presentations and how to critique other people's work in a friendly way and how to enlarge the background so that they'd have the right footnotes that people would think they you know, would understand that they knew this field in it. And so I, I was very proud of that and we got more, I'm sure we got more people into legal education. I, but that phenomenon of, you know, the number of times, I've been teaching, I taught for 39 years, I think, and the number of times I had a female gunner that I can remember was one. That's mm -hmm. it. <laughs> they're, they're men. <laughs> Right, and their, we know from their a lot mothers of mothers just thought everything they said was so hunky dory. I suppose. <laughs> and we know, and we know from a lot of research from Lenny Guinier and others that yeah. women do remain more silent. Yeah, yeah. In in classes, so yeah, um, yeah they did. Okay, and then um, I 
I teach gender in the law is one of the other things that, yeah. I, that I teach. And so you come up in that context right, as well. So tell me how you branched off a little bit into that area. Yeah, I wrote, uh, in, I wrote something called The Feminist and the Pragmatist. That's the one that's in the books. And, and um, well, of course, f for much of this time, I can't remember when we hired another woman. I think we did. We hired Ellen Sachs. I, uh, I'm really glad we hired her. You know who she is? I'm not. Oh, wow. She's just an amazing. Do you know who Ellen Sachs is? Okay, well, she's a woman who's written a whole lot about mental health. It turns out she's schizophrenic herself, ah. and, and she learned how to handle it. She's absolutely amazing. But we hired her and some other women eventually. But, but Resnick and I were interested in, in gender stuff, among other things. She's a civil pro person, civ pro person and right. I was a property person, but we were interested in that. And um, we did hire the, I think the next, after the two of us, I think the next woman we hired was Catherine Wells, who's now at one of the Boston schools. She, that's where she's from. But we hired her, and, and she had a PhD in philosophy, and she had studied pragmatism, and, and she wanted to invite the big pragmatic philosophers and also law professors to a conference. And so she and I organized this conference on law and pragmatism, which was a very good one. It was, I'll never, I don't want to do any more conferences though. It was, you, to get Judge Posner to come, you have to say somebody else is coming, but to get that person to come, you have, have to, to say, yeah, right. yeah, yes. Luckily, Richard Rorty, may, he, may his memory be a blessing, he agreed to come because it was his topic, so then we got some other people. But, but yeah, so this was, this was partially organized because it was her field, but I got into it, and that's how I wrote that paper, and it was published in Southern California, but it's been reprinted a lot. And um, this affirmative action one has not been reprinted as much because it wasn't published in a place that people can find, but it's called Affirmative Action Rhetoric, and I, I still feel strongly about it. Right, um, right. I visited Harvard in um, 83, 4, no, 84, 5, I guess, when my son was, he was 11 months old when I got there. So I was carrying a baby around and in my early 40s and visiting Harvard, and I taught property to a small section, and several of the people I taught are now professors um, there, but uh, I won't name names. I would name names, but you know, I, I was told I was affirmative action basically, and I was really mad. I thought, I want to go back where they don't think that. Because it was like, they were, in those days at Harvard, they were having a bunch of women in and a bunch of women out. Just ask Deborah Rohde, you're going to see her next. Mm -hmm. She was there when I was there. They did the same thing to her, even though she was at a fancier school because I was still at USC. But we bring women in, the students see them, then the women go out again. It took them a while to get over that. Um, they had they had a couple, you know, they had Martha Field there and Kathleen Sullivan was in her first year, so it wasn't that we were all visitors, but I think Lonnie Guineer was yet to come. I'm not sure, but I think so. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure about that. A anyway, I, enjo I enjoyed being there. I met some people I liked talking to, and, and I wrote this other article called Market and Alienability, which I, and then my, my people that I knew one of whom was on Law Review and one of whom was an advisor pushed the Law Review to do it. And I found that out only about a year ago. They pushed the Law Review to do it. And it's on the most cited list of all time, too. But they weren't, they were worried about it. <laughs> so. Do you suppose it was because it was you, or it was a, a woman who wrote it, or it was because? I don't know. I, I think it was, I mentioned the name Marx. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, for some reason that makes people all edgy. It made them upset. Yeah. But, um, but, but it was a woman involved. You may remember if you're old enough, at that time before we got electronic notifications of what things were published, they handed around a, a, pa a, you know, a paper booklet that had new articles in it. So right. we could all, the library passed these out. So, and so when Market and Alienability came out in 87 in the Harvard Law Review, it, they filed it under Women and the Law. They did. They filed, wow. it under, they filed it under women in the law. <laughs> Rather than it's more obvious place. Yes, yes. It's, um. <laughs> so how did you get to visiting at Harvard? Because um, you've mentioned in 
that you visited there, and, and I know you were also connected with, let's see, the University of Michigan, and then now at Toronto. Well, okay, so. I visited Harvard. I'm not sure how. You might ask Kathleen Sullivan, because, because I think she was already there, but she had discovered property and personhood when she started giving her talks on the, on the campaign trail. And of course, have you ever seen her speak? She's the best law speaker I've ever seen. She oh, is I just, would like that. No wonder she became a first-rate attorney. I mean, she's just wonderful at it. So, so everybody wanted to hire her. So she started out, at, as you do, talking to maybe Northwestern or Virginia or something, but got interviewed at Harvard and got the job. And I think she... And I don't, I think she may have m mentioned it to somebody because they knew about this article and I'm, I'm not sure who knew about it. But it, it, it got published in 81, so some of them may have known about it. They had, some, they had some people who considered themselves crits in those days. Maybe they knew about it. Hmm. Right. Hmm. I have a great story about my obligatory lunch with one of the famous crits, too. Oh, well, do tell. You have time? Oh, yes. No, okay. Well, this. Oh, no, no, we don't. Do we? Yes, we do. Oh, you have, sure we you have do. time? Because I'm not sure we've finished your questions. So. Well, well, we, we haven't made it up to my latter day musician line. Wait, yes, I, and we'll, we'll get there, but the, right. the critic. The the, well, the crit person, the crit guy, uh, took me to lunch as was obligatory. And he then tells me his leftist spiel, which is well, you're at USC and I'm at Harvard, but the only reason. That you're um, that you're not at a fancier school was you. I'm a guy and I got better test scores, and so I said, "What'd you get?" <laughs> <laughs> I did it, and of course I got better. I knew I did, but they, it was uh. <laughs> they made assumptions, right? And uh, in '84, the spring I was there, there was a critical feminist meeting rather than the yearly critical legal studies meeting and so we discussed some feminist topics and um, and uh, and after we after we did that then another famous, very famous crit not the same one got up in the plenary and said well now we've discussed feminism can we go back to critical legal studies mm. he actually said that so, so lots of things were still being said in the 80s, I'm, I'm sorry to say. And um, I'm a little sad. I mean, things are a lot better for women as far as becoming attorneys. I know that. But I thought things would be a lot better by the time I retired than they really are now, honestly. I did. Because um, never mind. They're just saying, they're still saying these really prejudicial things, mm -hmm. and they're saying them out loud even, not even mm -hmm. keeping them quiet, yeah. Yep, and I do want to ask you some retrospective ahead, questions. Some but, questions. Well, yeah, I want to ask the retrospective ones, but I want to sort of kind of catch us up. So, How did I go to Michigan? So, yeah, so you, so, so your kids went to college and you went back into the, the music. Yeah. And yeah. that's when, was that, I'm sorry if I recall, Mich you were at Michigan then? Well, so I got invited to... I got invited to, when my second kid went to college and I was alone in the, in the house, I decided to visit some other places. So, so I decided to visit Berkeley and NYU one semester each. And after that, I got invited to be a fellow in law and public affairs at Princeton. And so I wanted to take that too. Um, but Stanford said that you couldn't be on leave more than one year. I think mm. this was, I think this could be attributable to Condi Rice when she was provost. I don't know for sure, but mm -hmm. I was once with a group that tried to discuss women's pay equity issues with her, and we didn't get very far, I must say. But anyway, um, they said you can't do that, and I wanted to do that. My daughter had gone to Princeton as an undergrad, and I liked the Princeton thing anyway, and so I wanted to do it. So, so I just. And, and at that time, they were doing an economics-y thing to ask older people to leave Stanford, so they paid, they paid me to retire from Stanford. That's how come I retired early from Stanford. So, so I was retired from Stanford, and, and after that, um, I kind of thought I wanted to move on somewhere, and then, and then Michigan presented itself, which seemed like a nice place, so I did that. And, 
And I like that there they have two other women in intellectual property, both extremely smart and good. And I learned a lot and, and enjoyed being with them. So I sure hope they hire someone else now that I retired. <laughs> no, and so you retired again from Michigan. I retired again from Michigan um, this past June, basically. But not retired totally because now. No, but I keep, I keep agreeing to speak at conferences and then then I do the talk and then they want the paper and so and I'm gonna ha I have chapters well one two out and one forthcoming in three different Oxford books that are spin-offs from my boilerplate books so it looks like I have to write something else about that too it became I mean nobody does this if they're not US anyway you know mm -hmm. other countries don't other other countries even if they're well developed market economies don't have as many waivers of people's rights as we do. And, and as I went around to talk about this book on the, on the circuit, I found out that people teaching contracts don't even know that. They, some don't know that these have been illegal in the European Union since 1993. Wow. So I thought, okay, I need to go around and talk about this. So I have been, but I've also been practicing and, and playing in two orchestras and a woodwind quintet um, in Toronto where I like the school there. It's very um, multicultural. Canada is multicultural, and their school is, um, they know about different legal systems more than we do here. And, um, and they have uh, Kantian philosophers and not just, not just um, doctrinalists. They have those, and they have uh, law and economics, of course, but they have a lot of different stuff. And I liked it very much. And, and, um, so I attached myself to them, and and their music scene is wonderful. They have much more support for music mm -hmm. in Canada than they do in the U.S. right now. Wow. So so I'm able to play in two orchestras and use my music graduate school training to write program notes and give speeches about what the orchestra is playing and stuff like that. So it's great now. It's great. Yeah. yeah so c you com combining all right. all the stuff that you started with and 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 both my kids turned out absolutely great. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so yeah. Um, so let's kind of conclude on that. Yeah. So you told us the story of how, yeah. despite not having been not actually going back to Albuquerque, you have closed the you. circle, if you will, with mm. marrying a fellow um, yeah and person uh, from Albuquerque and more more than that we. This is his hometown, and he wants to be there. He's not as it's. He grew up there, but also did a lot of his life there. He's a he's a musician. He's a professional violinist, and violist too. So we bought a house there. So we have a house there. So we can go there, and and I we have a a, a place in Toronto too, and um, he's teaching music there some, and I'm playing music there some, and and I um, do things for the faculty of law some, and. And it worked out fine. And, and I, I have to tell you, the last thing is my, my daughter is a graduating medical school in, mm -hmm. at the end of this, this academic year. And, and my son is a, a lawyer in DC working for a firm called Innovative Discovery, which is one of these firms that he's a project manager and that, that works on helping firms and, and government do discovery. And, and he's good at it because he does both computers and people. And so I get to be, in spite of what my parents thought, I'm, I'm the best Jewish mother, right? <laughs> right? My son, the your son lawyer, the lawyer daughter, your daughter, the, the doctor. My daughter, the doctor. <laughs> right? That's, that's right. excellent. Right, right. So, so everything worked out OK. But looking back on it, I can't quite see how. There was a lot of serendipity there. I think as there often is. Yeah, there often so, is. Right? So, so in retrospect, then, yeah. um, you thought things would be further along now, I did. now being early 2016. Yeah, I did. Than they are. And yeah. what, um, if you have to provide some advice for young women who are thinking about law school but not yet enrolled, yeah. would you, what would you tell them? Oh. Or how about the even just women in women law students now? What yeah. would you tell them? I still think that the big firm practice is not good for women. It's not really good for men either. And and uh, 
if people get out before they're rejected for partner, it's good, you know, and some of them can go to the government, but, and some of them can go to um, alternative type jobs. But I, I would tell people to look seriously at other jobs, um, but I know that with huge student loan burdens, the, the high salary beckons, but then it seems to me, looking at people who do this, you spend a lot of the high salary on the lifestyle and you don't get to be with your family enough. I, I know some men who have taken the parental leave and I would really advise men to do that as much as possible. I certainly would, but, but oftentimes you get Right now, we're still in, I think, an interim situation where women get these positions that pay decently but will never be partner, and and they're then sort of, I don't know, a little bit, I mean, then it becomes just a job, and I can't wait till this job is done, which is a little different from what we hoped for. Right. So, so you know, the, the women students, at least the ones that I taught in the say four or five years ago in the first year classes, they're afraid of the F word, they won't mention it, that is feminism. And I am very sorry that that happened. I kind of, since I care about rhetoric, I'd like to find a word that they're not scared of because they are going into a workplace where this stuff is still there. It's, right. It is still there and they will have to find their way around it and it's not all gonna just be that they can have a family and they can have plenty of money and the lifestyle is not like that and I would like to have more truth telling about that but I don't want to be, I don't want to dump on people who are ambitious and who also have, many people enter law school wanting to do some good for the world and then they find out that they can't. I guess the international students can because they're bi or multicultural and multilingual and and I guess I would tell people to think about other places in the world, too, mm -hmm. rather than just um, coming to New York or Los Angeles, but good as it is, good as it is for some people. Right, right. right. So, um, but uh, you see, I don't know what to do. For, for all these years, as you can see, I never went into practice. I was a consultant a bit, but I, so I taught students to do a thing that I don't do for, 39 years and that's and I think I taught them pretty well how you have to practice law too how you have to find out whether it's worth it to the client to do something other than settle this most things should settle we all should know that the minute we get out of <laughs> law school and and we need to know how they might settle I think I taught all that I think I'm very practical but all the same I didn't do it and and there's a reason I didn't do it and and I wonder whether it's true for more women who do do it, I don't know. So I, I can't answer that question. I, I don't right. want to be Debbie Downer. Yeah, yeah. But I think it's harder out there than they realize. I think, in. I agree with you. And, and I, like wish they, I wish they would be okay with feminism, honestly. Right, and I teach gender in the law, and the last, every yeah. I start out every class, day yeah. one, with asking, before we do even one thing, how many people in the class identify as them with you know identify as feminists yeah. and I have very few that say they do by the end of the class. <laughs> oh, that's good. good Everybody for you. does. Do you Be have men in the class? I am starting to get men now. This is great. And and the first uh, the one one class the fir only one man man raised his hand saying he was a feminist mm. and maybe just a handful of the women. Mm. But when we this is great. Yeah, but when we talk about what feminism is and what it yeah. isn't. Yeah, um, you, everybody realizes they really yeah. are on board. Yeah, they, they just, are. They just the, they just the don't want to. They just don't want to have that. They don't want to have that yeah, label. The the people who are against us were able to fight something called equal rights by talking about bathrooms, and now they're trying to do it to gay people and transgender people. They're just we have to fight back against uh, and against um, ridiculous rhetoric and and. And I did do a little article in Arizona that I like called, called, a, called rhetorical capture, because that's what I think it is. It's rhetorical capture. So they captured feminism. So, mm -hmm. okay, we, can, we gotta take it back. Thank it you has, for talking to me. I really enjoyed it. Yes, it has been a delight. So thank you very much for your, your time. Thank you.